Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the first Professor Shabnath Bashir Memorial Lecture by Justice Murlidhar on Imagining Legal Education in Contemporary India. Uh, we are here to celebrate the memory of a person who, in many ways, um, challenged the rules of uh, Indian, the Indian Legal Academy in terms of as a teacher, as a practitioner, as, as, as a policymaker, uh, and in that sense, uh, uh, didn't bind himself to uh, the set rigid ways of uh, thinking in our academy. Uh, and, uh, and to celebrate that memory, uh, we really couldn't have a, a better speaker than Justice Murli uh, with uh, such an inspiring career as, as a lawyer first, and then uh, about 14 years on the bench now, um, and, uh, and now a, ju a judge of the Punjab and Haryana High Court. Um, so uh, I welcome you all to this lecture. Uh, the format will be that uh, Justice Murlidhar will uh, speak for 45 minutes, uh, followed by a Q&A. And then we also have with us uh, Swati Agarwal, who is the Director of Operations at IDIA, that was uh, 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 such so important uh, to Shamnath Bashir and uh, the manner in which he set up and the incredible work that has happened under the IDIA, Swati will uh, speak for a few minutes, followed by uh, Rohit Maman Alex, uh, who is a close friend of was uh, is a close friend of uh, uh, Shamnath Rashid's, uh, and we'll end with that with a sort of a five-minute uh, talk by Rohit uh, about Shamnath's life and work. Uh, so that's what we have lined up for you today. Um, so uh, without further ado, uh, I'll just hand over to uh, Justice Murli uh, for his lecture on imagining legal education in contemporary India. Uh, Justice Murli. Thank you, Anu. Uh, thank you, Lai Law. Uh, I consider it an honor to be asked to deliver the first Professor Shamnath Bashir Memorial Lecture on a topic that was close to Shamnath's heart. Those who have known Shamnath will agree that he was a person with a vibrant mind who exuded vitality and positivity. A product of the National Law School of India University in Bangalore, Shamnath constantly integrated the system of legal education in the country, and particularly the process of transformation it underwent with the advent of the National Law Schools. As an academic, Shamnath's primary passion was the field of intellectual property rights. Shamnath's work in the field of IPR and particularly in the area of pharmaceutical patents, was influential in shaping the approaches to the complex issues in the field. The blog he founded in 2005, Spicy IP, is widely read even today. Shamnath will always be remembered as a provocative teacher who challenged the young minds of several generations of law students who were fortunate to be taught by him at the NUJS Calcutta and elsewhere. Shamnath's cherished dream was to make legal education inclusive. He was critical of the manner in which the common law admission test, the CLAT, was devised and conducted. He was of the view that it kept out a large population of young underprivileged Indians from aspiring to join the national law universities. These concerns led him to conceive of and found early in 2010, the remarkable initiative, increasing diversity by increasing access to legal education, IDIA. IDIA's efforts saw the NLUs acknowledge the special needs of the differently abled students who might want to pursue a law course. A generation of daily wage workers, clerks, workers in stone quarries would see their next generation clear the clat, successfully navigate the five-year close in a national law school and become legal professionals. Undoubtedly, IDIA will be viewed as Shavanath's pioneering, transformative, and lasting contribution to legal education in India. It is a great pity that Shavanath left us when he was at its peak. His untimely departure will continue to be an irreplaceable loss to the legal field. Legal education in contemporary India has traveled a long way from 1855, when the first law department attached to the Bombay University commenced. Later, this was to become the Government Law College, GLC. Legal education has moved a considerable distance from where it was in 1958, 
when the law commission of india in its 14th report noted that in a period of about 10 years the position in regard to legal education has it appears definitely deteriorated the law commission's lament at that point in time was that and i quote the portals of our law teaching institutions manned by part time teachers are accessible to any graduate of mediocre ability and indifferent merits close quote that no longer may be true in the past 3 decades what has remained unchanged is the control of legal education by the bar council of india the bci and the university grants commission the ugc set up under the advocates act 1961 one of the functions of the bar council apart from laying down the criteria for enrollment of advocates and disciplining their conduct is to promote legal education and to lay down standards of such education in consultation with the universities in india imparting such education as well as the bar councils of the states the role of the ugc set up under another central enactment of 1956 is to coordinate and determine standards of teaching and examination in universities the law commission in 180 in 184th report on legal education in 2002 noted that the universities and the ugc too were concerned equally with the standards of legal education whether for practitioners or otherwise this apparent overlap in the functions of the bar council and the ugc was meant to be resolved by requiring each body to consult with the other while laying down standards of legal education including prescribing the core and elective subjects required to be taught in the law courses then there is the university to which the law school is affiliated which too has a say a significant change in the three decades since 1987 is the emergence of the national law universities the nlus although the five year law course was introduced first in 1983 in seven institutions across the country the first nlu offering an integrated ba llb course was set up under the 1986 statute of the karnataka legislature in bangalore with its first batch commencing in 1987 six years after the first batch passed out from nlui bangalore two more nlus were set up in 1998 in hyderabad and bhopal the nujs kolkata was set up in 1999 today we have 23 nlus all over the country the most recent in sonipat haryana in 2019 these nlus are subject to further control of the government of the state where they are located for over 3000 seats on offer in the nlus the admission in 22 of the 23 nlus is through a common law admission test the clat with nlu delhi conducting a separate one the all india law entrance test ilet although there were private law schools earlier as well a recent trend is the corporatization of legal education with business houses instituting private law universities which to offer a large number of seats and hold their own entrance tests some of these plus charge tuition and other fees way beyond the nlus these private law universities too are subject to the norms laid down by the bar council the ugc and the control of the respective state governments there is a mushrooming of law colleges in india the scenario today is best depicted in a recent resolution of the bar council announced through a press release on 12th august 2019 proposing a moratorium on the opening of new law colleges in the country for a period of 3 years the resolution explains the bar council was driven to take this step for the reason that and i quote there are about 1500 law colleges due to lethargy of universities and some state governments several colleges are running without proper infrastructure state governments seldom take interest in appointing law faculties in government law colleges and the constituent units state governments are granting no objection certificates and universities are granting affiliations recklessly universities are unable to stop the use of unfair means at the law exams in most of the rural areas the state governments do not show any interest in checking unfair means close quotes this is the bar council speaking the bar council does not spare the ugc either alleging that due to its negligence 90% of the law colleges do not get any grant to improve their standards the bar council adds that because it is very easy to get llm and phd degrees on account of total non concern of the hrd ministry and universities there is an acute dearth of good law teachers in the country that more or less sums up the bar council's view 
of the current status of legal education in over 1500 law schools. The Bar Council's angst notwithstanding, the push for newer law universities appears to be unstoppable. On 20th August 2020, the Punjab State Legislative Assembly, in a truncated three-hour monsoon session on account of COVID, found time to pass a law to set up the Guru Tegh Bahadur State Law University in Tarn Taran. I now turn to the situation in the NLUs. A report prepared in 2018 by Nalsar in Hyderabad at the request of the Ministry of Law and Justice, Government of India, after surveying the situation in 16 NLUs, had, among many other findings, this to say, and I quote, the institutions that were meant to be the torchbearers of systemic reforms are producing graduates who are diverted towards lucrative opportunities in the private sector, while the older institutions continue to be run with laxity. This has exacerbated the career ambulance that has always existed in India's legal profession. At the top of the legal education pyramid, we have a small group of highly selective institutions that have become feeders for the leading commercial law firms and business entities, while a vast majority of law, law departments and colleges continue to add to the pool of briefless barristers and graduates who will never use their law degree to earn a living. This was, in a sense, a confirmation of what was said in 2014 by legal scholars Jonathan Gingrich and Nick Robinson. They noted in their study titled Responding to the Market, the Impact of the Rise of Corporate Law Firms and on Elite Legal Education in India, that, and I quote, the impact of the corporate sector on elite legal education in India has become increasingly apparent as more and more graduates enter law firms and the administration and faculty of law schools navigate how they wish to situate themselves and their students in relation to this lucrative section of the legal market. Gingrich and Robinson noted that the choice of students in the NLUs, that the choice that students make in the NLUs about the courses they will opt for is dictated largely by the prospect of securing a corporate desk job. They gravitate towards electives that they think are likely to prove attractive to recruiters from law firms and in turn have pushed their law schools to offer more such electives. The head of an LA law school was candid that, and I quote, when students have an opportunity to choose electives, 80% will take mergers and acquisitions over international humanitarian law because students and their parents think that completing coursework on corporate subjects will make it easier to secure placement in a corporate desk job. Corporates have also stepped up to fund research on specific topics by instituting professorial chairs. Gingrich and Robinson note that of the 15 endowed chairs in the NLU at Bangalore, which includes chairs on human rights, PIL, refugee law, and so on. One chair on international finance and the other on ADR have been instituted by large corporate firms. A major Indian company in the private sector has endowed a chair on corporate governance. A PSU and a large private sector bank have endowed chairs in business law. There have also been concerns about the security of tenure of the teaching and non-teaching staff of the NLUs. The NASA report of 2018 pointed out that most of the NLUs have an, on average engaged 30 to 40 percent of their full-time teachers on ad hoc or visiting basis. Only three NLUs had engaged more than 80 percent of their faculty members in permanent positions. At most of the NLUs, the non-teaching staff members are also largely occupying temporary positions. The rapidly growing sector of private law universities, PLUs, were doing no better. They had, and I quote, a natural preference for contractual employments that make it easier to hire and fire talent as for the fluctuating needs of an employer, close quotes. There have also been protests by students in the NLUs in the past two years over a range of issues. The students' voices need listening to and their concerns factored in in the measures thought of to take legal education forward in the NLUs. The trend of an NLU or a private law university graduate preferring a job in a corporate law firm to litigating in courts may be changing. Those that have come into litigation are doing well, setting new benchmarks for the bar and have in a short span grown to being designated by many of the high courts in the Supreme Court. Many of them have risen to the rank of partners in large firms, both locally and internationally. 
as law as law researchers they have made a significant contribution to the work of judges they have also joined the judiciary and i am talking both of these subordinate courts as well as now the high courts some of them have come into academics where again they have distinguished themselves the other areas to which they have diversified are legal research law coaching centers for the clat they have branched out into other disciplines like anthropology writing and even film making for a variety of reasons not unexpected the gap in the quality and competence of those graduating from the nlus and plus on the one hand and other law colleges on the other remains yet every year 60 to 70000 law graduates enroll as advocates a majority of them passing through the non nlu law schools they are estimated to be over 1.7 million lawyers in the country 15% approximately of whom are women clearly there is a glut of lawyers in law practice the legal profession has grown increasingly competitive the distribution of the available work is skewed it is estimated that 80% of the litigating work is in the hands of less than 20% of the lawyers the fastest growing entities are the large law firms which seek to cater to a variety of legal service needs not just of body corporates but of governments and other entities as well in the major metropolises the individual lawyer is a vanishing breed instead one is witnessing the growth of a number of small and medium sized law firms aspiring to capture the work left over by the large corporate firms it is in this state of legal education in contemporary india that we are asked to imagine the future of legal education but the scenario need not be as gloomy as the above reports suggest there are some positive changes in the past few decades which i can believe be built upon to realize their full potential i know that the available time will not permit me to deal with all possible issues concerning legal education in the country i will therefore dwell on a few of them the foremost being that of accessibility primarily in the context of the nlus IDIA's diversity reports have, since they were first brought out in 2014, focused on the issues that students of the NLUs, coming from diverse backgrounds, face. A significant finding in the most recent report of 2018-19, and which reflects a consistent pattern, is that over 80 percent of the students joining the NLUs come from wealthy, urban, and English-speaking backgrounds. The average course fee. inclusive of tuition and boarding expenses in an nlu could range between 15 to 18 lakh rupees per annum and in the private law universities it could go up to 28 lakhs per annum more than 85% of the sample students and about 550 students were surveyed 85% of them had enrolled themselves in expensive coaching classes or online courses to prepare for the clat nearly 88% received funding from the parents and only 9% of the students opted for bank loans unsurprisingly the survey found that there was very little representation in the nlus of low income students the provision for reservation in the nlus including the domicile based reservation has not been able to increase sufficiently the accessibility to the nlus primarily because of the high costs of legal education combined with the relatively few scholarships on offer while this might seem a hopeless situation that is not how shamna viewed it the remarkable thing about idia was that it was able to identify students with some aptitude for the study of law from less privileged backgrounds with the key identifier being that of income followed by a round of interviews with their parents and teachers idia's team then took them on board for training for clearing the clat training was provided at some of the well established coaching institutes with prior arrangement a 2014 piece titled the making of legal elites and the idia idea of justice authored by shamna and three of his colleagues explains what the driving motive behind idia was and i here i quote that all who are part of the legal juggernaut have a collective responsibility ensuring that the marginalized sections are able to directly deploy the instrumentality of law 
to improve their lot and to contribute towards the creation of a more just and fair society. Secondly, an influx of the diverse student populations makes for a more optimal mix of views and perspectives at such law schools and consequently enriches the process of education itself. The statement of objectives also notes that enhanced diversity would, in the long run, translate to diversity within the upper excellence of the legal profession as well. This vision also explains why IDIA's support to its legal scholars does not stop at the point of their entry into an NNU. IDIA arranges for their financial support. As a first step, IDIA appealed to various NLUs to grant scholarships and fee waivers, free deductions to the IDIA scholars who gained admission. While three NLUs agreed to a full fee waiver, one did to a partial waiver. With the majority of the NLUs expressing inability to offer any financial assistance, IDIA began raising funds from individual and institutional donors, including partners at premier law firms around the country. IDEA also helped its scholars secure internships, which in turn would help enhance their employment prospects. IDIA's efforts since 2010 has ensured that of the 40 to 50 students from underprivileged background it identifies every year, around 15 are able to clear the CLAT and secure admission in an NLU. The others are able to find entry into non-NLU law schools and other graduate courses. The issue of inclusivity has also been sought to be addressed by IDIA. Its latest survey for 2018-19 states that hardly 3.4% of the NLU students were from rural areas or educated in vernacular medium schools. Less than 4% of the students in the leading NLUs were Muslim. There was an abysmally low representation from the Northeast of India. Disturbingly, nearly 54% of the surveyed students alleged discrimination and insulting or disparaging remarks against them on the grounds of political religious beliefs, social economic backgrounds, language, caste, appearance, and so on. There was a recent tragic incident when a student of the NLU in Jabalpur, one of the newer ones, committed suicide allegedly because of his poor proficiency in English. Nearly 55% faced culture shock. A large number of students cited lack of confidence, social awkwardness, and language barriers as reasons for not participating in either in co-curricular or extracurricular activities. Over 50% were unable to understand or cope with the curriculum. IDIA's experiment has ensured that a wide cross-section of the less privileged sections of our population could enter the portals of the NLUs. In 2013, among those IDIA scholars that made it into the NLUs, eight were differently abled, visually impaired, 13 were girls, nine from the scheduled castes, and five from the scheduled tribes. There was a significant geographical diversity as well, with scholars ailing from the Sundarbans in West Bengal, Gude Maranahari in Karnataka, Machili Patnam, Karnul, and Neluru in Andhra Pradesh, Rai Bareli in Uttar Pradesh, Hagwada in Punjab. Barbed in Rajasthan, Pitich in Jharkhand, Chingaweng in Mizoram, Kollam in Kerala, and El Gamnom in Manipur. To help them navigate law school life both academically and socially, IDIA scholars are allotted multiple mentors, comprising at least one senior student from within the law school, one from the profession, and one faculty member. IDIA has conceived of strategically designed training programs to enhance soft skills, that is well-spoken English, and resilience of its scholars, such that they're able to withstand a hostile, isolationist, and discriminatory outside environment to some extent. The idea was also to impart special leadership training programs. IDIA's research and policy team has, in Italia, helped challenge arbitrary eligibility criteria than use for admitting differently able students. It has advocated for a fairer testing framework through CLAT, one that does not disadvantage socially and economically disadvantaged sections of the society. It has also advocated for a disabled friendly entrance exam and made representations for the CLAT committee, highlighting the disadvantaged, disadvantages faced by students with disability. 
The question that Paul is tempted to ask is this. Can the IDIA experiment be scaled up by the state? Can it reach, can its reach extend to the thousands of law schools across the country? This has been a successful experiment with encouraging results. And there is no reason it should not be expanded to serve a larger population of students from underprivileged backgrounds. The hallmark of this experiment is the possibility of making legal education inclusive. I now turn to the another major part of the exercise as to how to make the uh, make legal education socially relevant. Law schools, in the words of Professor Upendra Bakshi, must be viewed as sites not only for legal excellence in legal education, but also of equity. Indeed, they must be affordable, accessible, and most importantly, they must foster socially relevant legal education. They must lay the basic foundation for the student in democratic practices, constitutional values of equality and non-discrimination, inclusivity and pluralism in the broadest sense of those terms, and very importantly, in the personal sphere. If a law school cannot teach its student to respect difference and dissent in a civil manner, it would have failed in a very fundamental way. Indian law schools could well do to cite the study of law in a context, social, economic, and political. The study of law must provoke curiosity about the lives of people, about processes and powers at work, whether state, corporate, civil society, political activists, mass movements. In addition, exposure to all kinds of politics would be essential. As Einstein reminded us, the value of college education is not the learning of many facts, but the training of the mind to think. Harvard professor Duncan Kennedy, while reminding us that law schools are intensely political spaces, also asks us to be aware that the present design of the law course will end up invariably reproducing the existing legal hierarchies. This requires to be constantly challenged through rigorous analytical interrogation. We need to ask, he says, why are we teaching and why are students being taught what is being taught? What is learned at the law school invariably dictates how one approaches issues later as a lawyer, as a judge, or as an academic. This approach to legal education will entail asking a whole set of questions. And here I quote a noted legal academic. Who legal education is helping? How and what does it mean for them? Does it help graduates get jobs? And if so, what sorts of jobs? What benefits accrue to our community by investing in the legally literate leaders of tomorrow? Support for civil society, its institutions, and the rule of law? Does legal education increase access to justice, advocacy for the vulnerable or the voiceless? Do current offerings entrench a legacy of exclusivity, status, prestige, and competitiveness? Is there opportunity to create an alternative legacy of inclusivity, opportunity, access to justice, innovation, entrepreneurship? If so, for whom? In further imagining the future of legal education, we need to ask, what should be taught in the law schools and how? In the Indian context, the vernacularizing of law would have to constitute an important objective of legal education. This in turn would entail simplifying legal language, demystifying legal processes, making law accessible and understandable. For instance, one is reminded of the street law project, which was pioneered by Professor David McQuart Mason in South Africa, where he made the understanding of the constitution of South Africa simple for the lay person then you could have a chronicling of people's histories of encounters with law. In a course on social justice, the literature on the lived experiences, and when I say literature, I don't mean just uh, prose, but poetry as well. The literature on the lived experiences of the scheduled caste, preferably translated versions rendered, rendered in uh, regional languages, should be part of the compulsory readings. When I was going through the compulsory readings for some of the law courses, in both the NLUs and the private law universities, I found very little translated readings of regional literature. And I think that's a great pity because the uh, uh, subaltern renderings of experiences with uh, uh, law in these writings 
provide a very rich source for law students to understand in what context the law functions. In studying the law on untouchability or of the prohibition of manual scavenging, the student will need to listen to the voices of the affected communities. From another perspective, what the teacher should be attempting to do is to help the student question the language of the law. Is it framed in the dominant voice? This is similar to the feminist critique of the male voice of the law relating to rape and sexual assault. I now touch upon the course specifications in the Bar Council of India's 2008 regulations. The current approach of the Bar Council is to prescribe a minimum of 18 core subjects, six optional subjects, and four compulsory practical papers. And these practical papers are moot court, alternative dispute resolution, ADR, drafting, pleading, and conveyancing, professional ethics, and accountancy. And these are to be completed either in a five-year or a three-year law course. And this is quite a hectic uh, schedule for a law student. Much of this is geared towards thinking and training to be a lawyer. And I must pause here for a minute to point out that of the six optional subjects that a student uh, is expected to uh, take, the choices from among seven groups of topics. And uh, these groups are like, for instance, constitutional law group, the corporate business law group, the international trade law group, the criminal law group. But what the BCI regulations mandate is that six subjects could be taken from any group. So it is possible that with human rights, media law, RTI, all being in the first constitutional law group, a student might well choose to just take three subjects from the business law group or the international trade law and not want to uh, know more about human rights law other than what little is taught in the core subjects. The practical papers underscore the larger role for the lawyers, not restricted to litigating in the court. These practical papers, as you will recall, are compulsory. The rationale behind these practical papers uh, is explained by two Indian legal scholars, and I quote them. Mere analytical skills of problem solving will not be sufficient to solve broader social legal problems. Members of the legal profession need to play the role of educator, planner, and counselor. Therefore, lawyers must be trained in skills that provide for a broader understanding of the various facets of legal problems. Fundamental lawyering skills are important to provide social justice. However, any set of skills confined only to traditional methods of problem solving would be manifestly insufficient." Close quote. Legal education therefore should focus not only on what lawyers actually do, but what on lawyers ought to do. Indian society needs socially sensitive and community-oriented community lawyers, who in turn would require a curriculum that exposes students not only to law and legal process, but also to the many factors that influence clients and the lawyers. This brings me to another aspect of legal education, which I wish to dwell upon, clinical legal education imparted at university law clinics. They provide an opportunity to the students to intermingle and understand how the problems of, of what the problems in the local population are. They would understand the limitations of legal language and how much could be lost in translation when a problem is sought to be fitted within the understood and given dimensions of formal little law, written law. It might call for innovative, innovative approaches and creative thinking on the part of both the faculty and the students to address these issues. A study was conducted in 2011 jointly by the Salgaonkar Law College in Goa, the Forum of South Asian Clinical Law Teachers, the Government of India, and the UNDP. And it was a study of the law school-based legal services clinics. And these were located in seven states that is Orissa, Bihar, Chhattisgarh, Jharkhand, Uttar Pradesh, Madhya Pradesh, and Rajasthan. The study was intended to understand the functioning of the legal aid cells established in these states by these law colleges and suggest ways and means to improve their functioning to act as effective instruments of access to justice. Interestingly, the study picked out seven law colleges for their best practices in the area and made a comparison with their counterparts in the USA and South Africa. These seven institutions, and these were spread across the country, they had innovated in devising outreach programs. And for instance, this included the NUJS, 
the uh, Salgaonkar College itself, Symbiosis Pune. And uh, these institutions had innovated in devising outreach programs that would reach legal services to the doorstep of the rural poor by locating some of the legal aid clinics there. They would have panels of lawyers and medical experts who could be reached out back to by the student paralegals in the clinics for actual interventions with the authorities or in the courts. As you will realize, most students don't have any authority or uh, you know, competence to actually take up a case in a court. So they would have to reach out to a lawyer. And what was remarkable about these experiments is the uh, panel of lawyers, other experts, who would then intervene once the student brought the problem to their notice. But this was only as regards seven law schools. The downside, as far as 38 other law schools who was, whose uh, legal clinics were studied, was that although nearly 82% of them had designated faculty to conduct legal aid activity in the clinics, only minuscule of them provided the facility of academic credit to the faculty in terms of workload lecture hours. And even in, for the students, there was no uh, incentive in, for, in the form of grades or marks. This in turn considerably reduced the enthusiasm for legal aid activity. It was considered burdensome or additional work. Also, lack of financial support and resources meant that the law colleges spared little effort in informing the community about their existence and availability of services. In fact, the study points out that this is the sharp contrast that one notices when you compare the legal aid clinics in uh, India and those that are operating, say, in the USA or South Africa. The National Legal Services Authority, NALSA, has a set of regulations to guide the working of university law clinics. These need to be implemented. If the work of the university law clinics can be dovetailed into the work of the district legal services committees functioning under the Legal Services Authority Act, it would give the clinics statutory backing, which in turn would persuade the authorities at a local level to be more responsible. This could include offering a wide range of legal services in a rural setting, like ensuring, for instance, the disbursement of the Manrega wages, pensions, rations, benefits under various welfare schemes, mutation in land records, and so on. My takeaway from the 2011 study is that there are ex these are excellent examples of fully functional and effective legal aid clinics, but they are in a small clutch of law universities and colleges but they are worthy of being emulated. Their techniques and practices can form a template for replication. In fact, I would suggest that with this study itself being almost a decade old, there is a need for a fresh study to be undertaken of the university law clinics and legal aid centers operated by law colleges all over the country. The offering of legal services in university law clinics requires to be viewed as a work in progress and made an integral component of the law curriculum. And next, move on to what I think a law college should do to take advantage of its geographical location. Much has been written and spoken about teaching methods in law schools. I do not wish to go over that here. However, I do wish to talk about the need for a law school in the Indian setting to exploit to the full its geographical location. Mahatma Gandhi is attributed with saying, and I quote, True education must correspond to the surrounding circumstances, or it is not a healthy growth." Close quote. The law school as an institution would have to communicate with its uh, environment geographically and sociologically, and account for the cultural specificity of its immediate surroundings. For instance, the law school in Ranchi would give students an opportunity to mingle with and understand the surrounding population in an area much of which is governed by the fifth schedule to the constitution, which preserves the customary laws and practices peculiar to those areas. For instance, the uh, Santal Pargana area. A law school in the Northeast should be able to expose the students to the diversity of customary tribal practices and laws, and to understand the tensions that exist between the formal legal system and the traditional but informal legal systems that continue to govern the societies. In fact, even this stands protected to some extent in the sixth schedule to the constitution. In the context of exploitation of valuable natural resources, which are the common property of communities for several generations, the taking over of these natural resources in the pretext of development, that issue 
could be studied by a law school, which is situated near the site of such contestation. If the students went there, it might provide them an opportunity, not only of engaging with the local population and understanding their resistance, but also from the cultural and spiritual standpoints of that population. Also taking the student to the place where the event is occurring changes dramatically the student's perspective and understanding of the issue. While teaching Olga Tennis, for instance, might it not be useful to have students visit a slum cluster, interact with its inhabitants in order to understand what issues they face in the course of a forced eviction drive? From my personal experience of teaching credit courses on economic, social, cultural rights in two uh, national law schools, I found that the next best device, if it was not possible to take students to the site of contestation, was the use of audiovisual techniques. The screening of a documentary on forced displacement on account of a power project, for instance, in which one can hear people speak about their problems in their own words. It helps the student understand much better than any classroom lecture. That brings up the issue of orienting law teachers to innovate teaching methods, especially suited to a particular legal environment. Perhaps it is time to explore the idea mooted by Professor Bakshi way back in 1974 of setting up a legal pedagogy institute to provide teacher training and facility for faculty improvement programs. One of the recommendations of the Rajya Sabha Standing Committee on Legal Reforms in 2016, and which needs serious consideration, is the setting up of academies for lawyers for providing continuing legal education and training. I'm aware that Kerala does have one lawyer's academy. The learning of the law has to be a continuous exercise for judges, for lawyers, and academics to enable coping with the changes occurring all around us. I must, I must digress here to share some personal insights of my learning differently about law and life through class action and public interest law. Collaborating with an urban planner, visiting the slum custom facing eviction, sitting down with its inhabitants there to discuss the case filed for them in the high court, planning with them the strategies, appraising them of the developments after each hearing, all of this was a huge learning experience. Likewise, with those involved in manual scavenging or the victims of the Bhopal gas disaster, listening to them articulate the concerns in their own voices, discussing with them the draft of the petition that was being filed, later explaining what had transpired during the hearing, contributed immensely to understanding the issue from a legal, sociological, and political perspective. It was a constant reminder that it was their voice that had to be heard in the court. That had to be preserved from being engulfed or distorted by the language of the law and the court. I now turn to the last part of my talk, the challenge of having to deal with changes brought about by technology. Richard Susskind anticipates that in the not too distant future, Richard Susskind is uh, uh, known for his work on uh, the future of the law and his book, Tomorrow's Lawyers is uh, very widely read. He anticipates that in the not too distant future, the legal services sector might witness major changes and perhaps might be supplanted by the use of technology, interactive online, online dispute resolution or ODR, transaction planning, discovery and document management, legal filings and even defense in certain pretty criminal cases of traffic violations. You will recall that in the recent past, in several states, we've had uh, the inauguration of uh, some kind of online dispute resolution of traffic offenses. In this context, academician Carrie Menkel Meadow asks, and I quote, should we be teaching students how to develop, design, and manage such dispute systems? Should we be teaching about or worrying about how those with little, uh, little computer literacy or ability, the aged, the disabled, the poor, will access such services? Those in the field of law and technology claim that artificial intelligence, AI, will be a boon to access to justice, and we must reorient our teaching and training to it. Others document how algorithmic justice might be very dangerous in both under and over inclusiveness in a data driven decision making. Another academician, Sally Kift, she has a different take, and she pertinently asks, and I quote, Obviously, the acquisition of digital literacies is critical, but the ethical ambiguity inherent in automation and AI in particular 
will place a high premium on ethical standards, moral judgment, and criticality. Moreover, legal educators will need to be constantly vigilant and iteratively scanning for other desirable 21st century skills, particularly those that are harder to automate. And there's a whole list of skills which are hard, according to Sally Kiff, to automate. Emotional intelligence, interpersonal skills, human logic, creativity, interdisciplinarity, and its enabler of collaboration skills, adaptability, resilience, design thinking, strategy, leadership, self-regulation, and empathy. Indeed, that's a long list of things that can't be automated. And in the context of the recent Me Too movement, which saw the extensive use of Twitter and other social media to aggregate and publicize legal claims with concerns arising about due process, Carrie Menkel Meadow asks, and I quote, what will our new law students think of law as social media allows postings of fake news and judgments without formal proceedings or trials? What kind of legal ethics will this brave new world require? Also, we must remember that in India, there is a very real issue of the digital divide. Legal education itself is undergoing other kinds of transformation. We now have massive online open courses offered by uh, leading uh, law institutions in the US and other forms of distance learning being offered by leading law schools. We also have the Khan Academy, we have the Coursera, and this is all free. You could just go online, enroll for a course, even in law, and uh, equip yourself. Recently in India too, there has been an attempt at offering a virtual law course. The COVID pandemic is no doubt a crisis that has thrown up a huge challenge in how we live and function, but it has offered a new set of opportunities. The possibilities of expanding the frontiers of knowledge, it would seem, is endless. The present system of media houses ranking law schools on parameters that include the ability of a passing out batch to secure placements in leading corporate houses and firms can hardly be considered reliable. Unfortunately, this to a large extent determines the choice of the top rank holders in the CLAT in opting for an NLE. In this context, among the many useful suggestions in the 2018 report of Nalsar, which is worth considering, is one pertaining to evaluating the performance of law colleges. The report asks for an authoritative ranking of the NLUs by a publicly reliable source, and it suggests that the National Institutional Ranking Framework, that is the NIRF, introduced by the Ministry of Human Resources Development, Government of India, it should include the NLUs as one of the subcategories in their annual exercise of ranking higher education institutions in India. Hopefully, the parameters that such a body would deploy to evaluate a law school would read something like this. If a law school teaches its student to be open to new ways of thinking, respect others' choices while not imposing one's own, to retain civility in dissent and argument, to embrace difference, inclusivity, and pluralism, to never abandon the constitutional values of liberty, freedom, equality, fraternity, and dignity, to imbue constitutional morality as an uncompromising value of life, to question, confront, challenge, abuse of authority and power, to recognize the fight for injust against injustice by lawful means, to be ever open to change and learning, then such a law school would have served its purpose. Thank you all for a very patient listening and thank you again, LiveLaw and IDI. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, thank, thank you for that um, very uh, provocative lecture and uh, urging us to think about such a wide and complex range of issues that interact uh, in assessing uh, legal education today and thinking about its future from under-regulation to over-regulation, uh, inclusivity, what we teach uh, in our law schools and the role they play in society and what we can do. Um, and, and now we'll just move on to the Q&A session. And in just sending across your questions, can I uh, please request all of you uh, to only send questions that are relevant to the theme of discussion today. And those are the only questions I will be uh, considering and putting forward to Justice Murlidhar. Um, uh, 
Justin Muli, that if I can start off while we wait for the questions to come in. Yes. Um, uh, in in the sort of broader imagination of what are we doing with legal education, right? I mean, in terms of there seems to be a crisis of identity in the sense that um, should we imagine legal education as training for the profession, right? And then therefore you can see that, and you can see that bias in the Bar Council of India being the uh, regulatory body and, and the complex relationship between the Bar Council of India and the UGC that you spoke about. Uh, but that underlies a, a rather tricky question of what are we doing with legal education, right? Is it is it training for the profession or is it a broader education that we imagine for the for the kind of social relevance that you spoke about? Uh, yeah. And and uh, do you think there's a need to I mean and that need to tease out that complexity there and in terms of the courses we offer the pedagogy that we adopt um, yeah. and, uh, and 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 that always seems to interfere with the expectation of the students, expectation of the bar these conversations on practicality. Uh, uh, so how do we tease that out? No, actually, the, the uh, uh, very nature of the legal profession itself is complex. The presumption that uh, it's all about training to be a lawyer who will litigate in courts is a very limited understanding of you know, what legal education is all about. In fact, the lawyer combines in himself a variety of skills. Uh, for instance, in law firms, you have uh, you know, lawyers who are very skilled negotiators. In the ADR field, again, you have people, lawyers who are able to be, uh, uh, you know, uh, negotiators, counselors. So the lawyer's role itself is undergoing a large uh, number of changes. And uh, therefore, the law school or the uh, law curriculum should acknowledge for this complex nature of the uh, role of a lawyer. For instance, lawyers in the rural setting have to have a different set of skills. Lawyers in an urban setting will have a different set of skills. And uh, it's not just about lawyers. You're also training people to be judges. You're training them to be academics. So it should offer a wide spectrum from which, you know, students can choose without having to be worried about, you know, am I going to make up all this money that I'm spending on legal education? Then you're driven, driving all of them in one direction. In fact, I am very happy that I'm not a law student of today. Just imagine a 23-year-old being you know, offered a job which offers, let's say, uh, 12 to 15 lakhs per annum. And to expect such a student to turn it down, you know, it's unfair. I don't know whether I would have turned it down. So I'm glad I didn't have that kind of an option. But you know, we must make it uh, uh, possible for students to you know, imagine differently their own future uh, and not restricted to working in a corporate law firm. And there is also a lot of stress about getting into the courts, you know, whether I'll be able to work in a good law office with a, with a good senior. So there's handholding that is needed. So the Bar Council needs to think, you know, more proactively. And uh, we need to come together to pull in a lot of, uh, you know, brains to see the wider spectrum of legal education to serve a wider range of needs. Suppose a student has an aptitude, aptitude to be a judge. Why can't the law school offer, you know, courses that will help them go in that direction? So I think it's an opportunity. I would look at it as an opportunity. I don't, I'm, I don't look on, look on, look on this as uh, something uh, which is unmanageable, undoable. It is right. certainly doable. We just have to rework some of these things. Like the right. syllabus is talking about uh, the Bar Council's uh, legal, uh, the rules of 2008. It's 12 years old. You have the curriculum development uh, committees, but there needs to be active consultation on a yearly basis. So if those mechanisms you know, do not get activated, then you will have this thing of a mismatch between what is expected and what is on offer. Uh, so, so some of the questions that are coming in are on the uh, regulation of uh, the national law universities and, and the governance structures. Um, and if I may just uh, take off from that and broaden the question and, and, and ask if you could reflect on what are the broader political implications of the governance structures that we see at the NLUs uh, in terms of their dependence on the state for funding, right? Uh, and then the terrible choice between decreasing 
uh, with falling state support, and then that means increasing student fees, and that has an impact on uh, inclusivity as you as you uh, dealt with. Uh, and more importantly, also apart from the state government's uh, dependence on the state government, uh, the role of the judiciary itself uh, in the governance of the law schools um, does that. What what implications does it have for the legal academy in terms of the work it's producing and the work it's engaging in or can engage in, uh, given that these are the structural realities of its governance? Yeah, actually, uh, if you look at the 184th report of the Law Commission, uh, it dealt frankly with this question, should Bar Council be out of legal education altogether? But the Law Commission was not uh, in favor of that. Because after all, the Bar Council does represent the lawyers. I mean, we may not be entirely you know, uh, satisfied with the way the Bar Council functions. And, and, uh, in, in, for instance, uh, the disciplinary pass of the Bar Council, it's coming for some criticism and whether it's really an effective means of uh, checking misconduct of lawyers. But the role of Bar Council in legal education, when the Law Commission was asked, you know, should Bar Council continue to be in this area? The, uh, uh, the Law Commission felt that uh, it was not the time to say the Bar Council should be out of it altogether. Of course, there have been recommendations for an overarching uh, body, which deals with higher education all over the country, which should also take on board legal education. Uh, but I still think that uh, we are not in a situation to say that the lawyers should not have a say in legal education. Just as much, we can't say that the University Grants Commission or the university should not. So I think uh, the way to go forward is to take forward the recommendation of the Law Commission's 184th report, where there's an active consultation between the legal education committees of the UGC and the Bar Council. There has to be a more rigorous exercise. And if we take on board experts who will have valuable inputs to give, and there is a large amount of that available in the public domain, we just have to look for it. And you have to seek that kind of expertise and if we get it, I'm sure we can devise courses which can design uh, 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 curriculums in uh, you know, different uh, law universities that will have uh, you know, uh, more relevance to the needs. There is a new issue of finances. There is an issue of uh, you know, uh, control of uh, law universities. But uh, I think the overall uh, uh, objective should be to make socially, uh, uh, to give offer socially relevant legal education yeah. and uh, give it a kind of priority that it deserves. I think today it's not getting the kind of priority. We are somehow presuming that it will self-regulate and you know the best will come out of this process. But if you're going to have this huge gap between the students coming out from 1500 law colleges and those coming out from the NLUs, uh, it's not good for the, the future of legal education. I think that the urgency with which this needs to be tackled, yeah. that has not got reflected. Yes. Again, uh, taking your other question about governance of the NLUs and all of that, I think this is all a work in progress. Uh, we have a tendency to get on board people having uh, a greater uh, you know, experience of working with the law. So when you talk of people working with the law, you invariably talk of uh, lawyers and judges and some law academics. So this seems to be the cluster of people who will be involved in the governance structure. And that's got of replicated. So what has happened is you took the statute that constituted the NLU in Bangalore and then kept tinkering with that small modifications to replicate for every uh, NLU statute. Now, there has to be an audit of that system. So before I recommend a change or you recommend a change, we need to know precisely what are the areas where the change is needed? Why has it not worked well enough? That audit has to happen, which is why I find that Nalsar 2018 report to be very useful. It has a large number of suggestions on some of the questions that you're asking, and it's a study commissioned by the government of India. I think if that report is studied in greater depth and by a wide range of actors, I think you can come forth with you know, uh, the next moves to actualize those recommendations. After all, why do you commission a study? Why do you ask for a report? It's a kind of an audit. I think that report, I would say it's, it's some kind of an audit, although it's not uh, an audit in the true sense. For instance, we don't know how many national law universities are today in the red. Are they making profits? We have no, no, no idea at all. How are they managing the finances? 
what are the sources of funds and how are they deployed so i'm saying we just need a thorough audit of the functioning of nlus before we begin to recommend uh, changes okay so uh, another set of questions coming up and i'm just going to again take uh, parts of those questions and frame it uh, is that is there a bias uh, towards in in thinking about legal education and in talking about legal education that we almost seem to uh, always exclusively focus on the nlus and as you rightly pointed out the proportion is so skewed in terms of uh, number of law, uh, law students graduating or registering with the bar uh, that the bulk is coming from elsewhere um and yet the conversation seems to be skewed in the other direction uh, that we seem to worry about uh, the nlus a lot more and discuss that a lot more seek to find solutions there a lot more uh than uh, the majority of those 1500 law colleges that you spoke about yeah. um, very, is, is there a need to yeah. is there a need to reorient the conversation or do you think we first need to fix the nlus uh, or maybe not uh, it's not a first and second kind of thing but why do you, what are the consequences of this nlu bias uh in in the conversation on uh, legal education it's a very very uh, valid question in fact when i was preparing for the talk i found that in the public domain there is a lot of uh, writing on the functional nlus because somehow it was easier because there are fewer nlus there are about 20 23 of them it's easier to go and gather data from the nlus and students in the nlus than to go to 1500 law colleges in the country and you know speak to the faculty and students in all of those law colleges so in fact in my talk therefore i consciously focused on another study of the clinical uh, uh, law yeah. law college clinics the legal aid clinics in those other law colleges there were 40 of them in fact you don't have enough studies of the functioning of the 1500 and odd law colleges one would have thought the bar council of india will put out relevant information but the information available on the bar council website if you go there it's yeah. largely sketchy in fact i was trying to find information on you know how many law students are studying in 1500 law colleges what is the kind of fees they pay we have not no such information in the public domain so it there is a tendency therefore to talk more about the nlus but mm. there is also a reason why we are talking about nlus just as yeah. in the health sector what has happened in the education sector is the withdrawal of the state the state yeah. wants to get less and less involved and privatize education this is a trend world over it's not uh, unique to india so india too in the area of legal education we have allowed the private sector to come in and we uh, you know the private law universities are there in a big way the private law colleges are there in a big way so we we tend to look at the changes that have happened in the last 30 years the biggest change is the nlus so we tend to talk about these changes also to ask whether these changes have really improved the quality of legal education or not but i fully agree that we need to definitely talk of the 1500 law colleges which are producing the bulk of the uh, law graduates who come into the legal profession in fact even the subordinate judiciary we do have uh, you know a smattering of uh, uh, nlu graduates coming into the subordinate judiciary but a bulk of them have are law graduates from the non nlus so we do need to talk but for which again we need to have studies commissioned to uh, look into the working of the law colleges and how many of them are you know actually effective meet with all the norms i just read out the passage of the bar councils resolution it's so telling the yeah. bar council is saying that we need to you know have a moratorium on new law colleges and telling us all the problems with the existing law colleges but again that paragraph in the bar council resolution is not based on any intensive comprehensive study undertaken and i think there's a need to undertake that study i fully agree with the question yeah uh the, the next uh, point that i want to pick up on uh is uh your the, the role of the legal academic uh right in both uh in both the university space and as researchers outside the university space um in how do you view their role in in terms of um uh analyzing the system commenting on the system uh and 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 the restrictions that are placed in terms of even even let's say of a legal ac academic within a university space of how much of what 
what can you work on and what can you say given the governance structures uh, that are operating on these universities that's one part of the question on the legal academic and the second is uh, the training within law schools also to say that we need to train people to be legal academics uh, and and what might that require that is quite distinct from let's say uh training law uh, uh students to be practitioners of the law so both these questions in terms of uh what can they work on what can they say and second uh is is the training then distinctly different uh or what should law schools do to generate that kind of uh, uh critical mass of legal academics uh so somewhere in the talk i also touched upon this that uh in a majority of the, even the nlus there's a shortage of uh, uh, faculty right and they're finding it very difficult to uh, hire and retain faculty because there's a large turnover of faculty as well and uh, some of the uh, reason for the student unrest in some of these nlus is uh, this apart from a whole host of other issues uh, the legal academic i think has a very very important role in shaping the thinking of the suit in fact i uh, uh, urge you to read uh, dr radha krishnan's uh, writings on this where he says that a teacher should place different points of view without urging the student to follow any particular point of view but you have to place with the student different points of view i was looking at the course structures in some of the private law universities and even the nlus and uh, there's a vast difference between you know how a course is designed by an academic who has had a background of education either through the nlu or abroad having done an llm or a doctorate abroad and a person who's come through the uh, regular system here law colleges doing the llm here there is a difference in how you even devise the course structure and uh, given the whole range diverse uh, you know cross section of students that you have in a class some of this could be too dense for instance there was a course on marx and law all right which prescribes readings writings of marx himself and people analyzing you know marx's writings now for a person who's come through the 10 plus 2 system and who's some 18 or 19 years old you know it would be actually too difficult for them to immediately grasp what is being said how it is being explained which is why in the indian uh, system the langdelian method or you know the socratic method as we talk where one decision is taken up and analyzed thread bare and different points of view discussed by being guided by the uh, law professor that doesn't quite work because the habit of intensive concentrated reading which is what you need to build yourself to be an academic and to have an analytical mind that requires training to answer your question therefore the teacher will have to in a classroom take the effort of finding out how much of this is really absorbed by the student does, does the language of the law need to be simplified and i'm not talking here of literacy see the language of the law can be complex and when i talked of uh, simplifying the legal language i meant it simplified even for a student who is 18 or 19 years old otherwise you lose the student now if you walk into a law college which is a non nlu you will find the language spoken by the teacher the language spoken by the student to be very different so how do we you know uh, scale up and scale down yeah. so that you know because this is an experiment we are still in experimental mode as far as nlus are concerned and we need more legal academics we, there's a huge shortage of legal academics and we need to make that attractive at one level if you're going to only have contractual appointments ad hoc appointments there's no incentive to become a legal academic you know you're becoming then out of desperation because you've nothing else to do i mean you can't make it in the legal profession you have a, you don't have a higher paying job but you have a skill but what is on offer is only an ad hoc position so i think we need to again you know again in the nalsa 2018 report there are useful suggestions on this on how do we train students to be legal academics there is a possibility there's a sure possibility but i think we need to address the uh, situation from the indian standpoint where we are we need to take a hard look we should not imagine we are somewhere and we are not if you look at uh, professor bakshi's writings of 1974 75 what the status of legal education then was 
much of it is relevant even today because we are projecting something that probably we are not but we have the capacity and the potential to you know change and improve i think we just need to bring the right moves together right people together to achieve that right uh so a, a set of questions coming on uh, what we must teach in uh, law schools uh, and and our law colleges and if i may just use that as a take off point to get you to reflect on what you think of uh nlu's as a single discipline universities uh, you know that kind of imagination that uh, what is what what should we make of it uh, of this experiment uh since the 19 since 1987 of course there are uh, the social science and humanities subjects taught in the law schools but there are there have always been concerns with uh uh with that aspect of legal education um how I mean is what do you make of this uh single discipline university or is is it absolutely necessary for the learning experience of a law student that legal education be located within a truly interdisciplinary space um uh, within a larger university yeah i think the question answers itself i think we can't uh, doubt that we need an interdisciplinary approach i mean the from whatever i've read and uh, the uh, wisdom of uh, teachers of law of the past two they all emphasize the interdisciplinary approach so i think that's a, a definitely a positive step forward because law can't be studied in isolation and it has to be studied in the context i can't study the law of reservations for instance without understanding sociology so if earlier we were studying uh, the constitution as a legal text and not as a political text and not as a sociological you know uh, commentary on so these the way indian society is shaped we would be making a, a serious mistake because the law school is the place where students get exposed to different streams of you know uh, thinking and understanding that complexity in understanding the law can only be understood i mean uh, uh, fully realized when you bring in the other disciplines so the interdisciplinary approach i don't think there's any doubt that there must be that and even in other fields i'm just talking of uh, even economics law and economics uh, if you look looking at uh, you know uh, international trade law for instance you need to understand finance so there will be an element of other disciplines which you have to uh, equip yourself in and to that extent i think uh, there can be no doubt about that uh, but when i talked of vernacularizing of the law there are some issues peculiar to india and within india peculiar to states so if you have located a law school for instance in you know let's say chatisgarh it can be a pity that you don't understand the way law i mean society uh, exists in chatisgarh what are their encounters with the law and are there traditional legal systems and you know formal legal systems Yes. what is the conflict between that i think that opportunity should not be missed so uh, i would i would think that uh, law cannot never be viewed as a single discipline at all uh, and increasingly you will need an interdisciplinary approach to law whether it's uh, constitutional law criminal law civil law any law that you pick up you will need an interdisciplinary approach so uh, some questions on the interaction between uh legal education and and the profession and 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 the and the bar in that sense and and reflecting on um the barriers uh to entry into the bar and so and I, and i guess equally importantly survival at the bar uh and and the and and the structural realities of how the bar operates in india uh, uh do, do you really think that the problem that that you were highlighting in terms of um uh, what are the career choices that uh, law graduates are making uh, let's say even in the nlus uh, can really be i mean what can we do to solve the realities of the bar and and the huge structural barriers there in terms of uh, who gets in and who thrives there and who and who, for whom it is possible to survive there yeah i think this uh, debate has gone on for i don't know uh, uh for many many years 
uh, we expect the bar to self regulate itself and that's really not happening uh, it is market driven and uh, even the senior lawyers believe that if uh, you know somebody can afford to pay why cannot they pay and that huge gap between you know uh, in fact uh, professor galanter has done this wonderful uh, uh, study of grand advocates uh, and uh, somebody you should read that uh, paper is to study the senior advocates in uh, working the supreme court and uh, is uh, uh, and how they're all generalists they're not specialists and they take on far many more cases than they can handle but they still so much sought after and uh, what they say is taken very seriously and it is true that uh, uh, i'm just not the supreme court and just not about senior advocates any bar in any location uh, you will find a majority of the work controlled by a small percentage of lawyers that seems to be the way the bar works now can we democratize that space can we have you know equal distribution of work these are all big questions because if it's a marketplace people will go for the best so there is a way that uh, you know the bar shapes itself and i think it's rather than trying to change that we accept that as a reality and uh, see how we can you know uh, make entry into that easier for lawyers so for instance the placement schemes bar council of india used to have an earlier a placement scheme where the junior lawyer would be placed with the senior and the bar council would put in the money to you know uh, uh, give a stipend to that junior lawyer we didn't scale up that the number of lawyers went up the number of law graduates uh, coming out of law schools went up but we didn't scale up that uh, scheme so in every place like even when i talked about idia the idea is very good they but we need to scale up you can't expect idia to cater to the needs of all the underprivileged sections all over the country who want to enter law schools someone should come step step up so state has withdrawn the you know the welfare state is shrunk so we need to find the alternative otherwise it will continue to be market driven just that like the profession is market driven uh the legal education is now getting market driven so rather than uh, you know going the other way we've actually said education as a sector should be you know controlled by the market and therefore you see all these distortions which are bound to be there and in an indian setting once you say the market takes care of it you will have a growing inequality a huge gap between you know who controls that market and who gets left out so do we want to see education as a market knowledge as a commodity this commoditizing of knowledge that's been the biggest shift in the post uh, liberalization uh, you know era in the liberalization privatization globalization era the commoditizing of knowledge has become the central uh, you know uh, uh, point of uh, 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 examination or study which you would say which has uh, become the kind of determinant for the direction where we want to go so you have a number of private law universities and uh, they they are able to charge the highest fees and also pay the faculty therefore that much better so it is a dilemma of sorts that you know the best quality legal education is uh, is driven by money so that's how the market works it has always worked and all over the, and, and it's not just about india if you read the writings about the uh, growth of legal education in australia in england the story is the same you know the state has withdrawn the ma- market has entered and if you need the best quality you pay for it so it's like having a polo fortis you know in in, in health you have those equivalent uh, uh, you know models in the sphere of education as well yeah. it's happening in schools yeah. you have yeah. the national air conditioned schools and then you have the municipal schools not that the municipal schools don't need to do well i mean they do look at the experiment in delhi so and elsewhere some of the government schools are you know showing good results but we need to therefore find out what are those best practices but professor bakshi uh, recommended this he says if you're designing a law course if you're designing a curriculum why can't teachers across the country meet once a year and devise that and that becomes the you know a feeder for the uh, mm-hmm. law universities or law colleges 
so that you have some benchmark. Correct. Correct. Yeah. You know. Yeah. So that I think we need to first of all identify best practices. This talk was about that. I was trying to identify through that uh, 2011 uh, report on clinical legal education the best practice. Through IDIA's work, another best practice. So yeah. once you identify best practices, how do you scale it up? How do you make that as the reference point? And how do you get people on board to react to it and carry it forward? And this is one technique that we need to use. We have to work with what we have. I, for a one, will never be pessimistic about this. I think we're still a work in progress. As a country, as a democracy, we're still evolving. So we have uh, you know, uh, to go forward with it. And we have the brains. We have the brains, we have the resources. We need to tap, know to tap into them, bring them on board. So we need to be creative, we need to be innovative. It's a lot of work. Yeah. <laughs> and in terms of the last question to you, I mean, if I can just take it on a personal tangent and ask you about your experience as a law student. Uh, 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 yeah. So are, are there me... any are there are there any experiences that uh, really influenced your thinking during those years and, and yes. who you have become and uh, what were those most intense learning periods for you that shaped you as a lawyer uh, yeah. and, and as a person of the law? Yeah. So I must confess here that I understood very little about reservations till I entered the law college. And like numerous others, I felt, you know, the most meritorious students should not be denied the opportunity. And uh, I easily bought into it. And I, I was a chemistry graduate and I then came into law. Uh, the law college was a huge learning experience, not so much from the lectures, because that also was there, but just sharing space with people from different backgrounds. And why reservations were so important for them to be in that space. If there was no reservation, you know, you wouldn't have people from different backgrounds sitting there with you. And uh, how they absorbed certain elements of what was taught in the class was very different from the way I would absorb. So the learning was not just through the lectures or through the teacher, but the learning was also a peer learning that happened because you were sharing a space with people it also it opens up your mind. I mean, at a very fundamental level, you must be open to influences. You must allow yourself, and uh, you cannot restrict yourself because uh, the other person doesn't speak good English. The person may not be able to articulate well, but can communicate. You know, there's a two different things here. So all those understanding how you know that works. Of course, there were good teachers and not very good teachers, and that happens in all institutions. So I very distinctly remember this uh, uh, lecturer, uh, Professor Kupu Swami, who taught us the law of evidence. And he made it so attractive. The lecture was full of uh, uh, analogies and I mean uh, anecdotes. And uh, he could uh, uh, make it extremely interesting. And I had the uh, uh, advantage of uh, uh, him asking us to help him with a book he was writing on law of evidence. So that way you learn more about the law of evidence. So that was a, uh, something that uh, I think was valuable. And then moot court. So uh, there was no awareness in the Madras Law College, I'm talking of 1983-84, of uh, moot courts. So we had this uh, uh, notice that was received by the college about the Jessup moot. And that year it was being held in Pondicherry. And uh, nobody told us. I happened to be talking to some lawyer who had passed out from the Pondicherry Law College, who had gone to the Jessup moot. And he said, yeah, it happens every year. I said, every year? I've been in the law college for the last two and a half years, and I've never you know, come across this. He said, no, no, there is, and it's going to happen this month. So then I happened to go to the uh, you know, uh, office and pulled out the notice. I organized a moot court competition within the college. I mean, so uh, the mooting experience that I had also helped. And uh, on moots, of course, uh, that was an <laughs> law moot. But uh, now mooting has become one of the central uh, features of uh, legal education in the NLUs, at least. And I think law college is also trying to catch up with that. I think it's a useful experiment. And uh, uh, I wouldn't say entirely satisfactory, but definitely uh, opens up the student in a way that, uh, you know, Speaking, I mean, the classroom 
lecture format will not. Many students hesitate to speak up because they don't want to uh, be seen by others as not knowing enough. But the mood somehow breaks down your inhibitions. And uh, I think that but, was also a useful experience. But also, also an area of uh, great exclusion in the law schools in terms of who, it is. who benefits from it. And uh, yeah, I think how you devise these moods also is important. Yes, yes, if you exactly. only pick up problems of IPR, corporate law, contracts, you lose out a whole section of students. Suppose you picked up a case uh, of uh, a criminal case of rape of a Dalit woman and witnesses being, you know, people from different communities and castes. That kind of a mood problem will require a different kind of an understanding. So I'm just saying that, you know, how complex you make those mood problems, how yeah. do you contextualize it for the Indian setting? Yeah. That is very important. So what kind of case law will you pick up to hypothesize from? Yeah. These are important things. It will have uh, a great so, presentation. In fact, I've asked, what if the mood was not in English? What if it was in Hindi? It was in Kannada. It was in Tamil. You know, all your uh, convent educated uh, students may be at a disadvantage. So that way you balance out, you know, people with uh, easy fluent, uh, fluent in the regional language will be able to handle that mood very well. And that might be actually very interesting. So why don't we have moods in different languages? <laughs> uh, yeah, thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much for those thoughts and uh, making all of us think uh, a lot more deeply about uh, some of these structural issues that afflict education and in turn aff afflict the practice of the law and the bar and the bench also integrally connected. Um, and, uh, and, and we need to do a lot more work, uh, all of those at uh, yeah, all see. stakeholders. Yeah, we need to collectively take responsibility. I think waiting for some other body or institution to step in to bring about the change will just not. I think we have resources from within us. We look around, we push for that change. You know, we look, and I, I'm sorry to be repeating, but those best practices that exist around us, we pick up those best practices, we pick up those spirited people who contributed so much to making it like Shamnad himself, Shamnad's work. This needs to be built upon. Everything should be put in the doorstep of IDI. Yeah. There should be many more such, like Super 30. You know, that is getting replicated in small ways, that Super 30 experiment. Yeah. And it should happen more, more extensively. And I feel that's the way to go forward. So I'll, I'll just take this as the opportunity to move into the uh, uh, next part of the uh, today's yeah. program. Yeah. 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 Thank you so much, uh, Justice Mulidhar, uh, for a thought provoking uh, session with all of us, uh, and, and 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 perhaps it's a it's it's a great time for me to inform everyone who is listening in that uh, Live Law will be instituting uh, a need based scholarship in memory of uh, Shamnath Bashir uh, this year onwards. Uh, so uh, I think as as Justice Mulida was saying, we all need to take the collective responsibility uh, and uh, make and start thinking about this in a structural fashion and doing our bit for that. So. Uh, uh, so thank you to Live Law for uh, uh, doing this lecture and instituting that uh, scholarship. Uh, now uh, uh, I'd like to uh, invite uh, uh, Swati uh, to talk about uh, uh, Shamnath. Swati is the Director of Operations at IDIA for the last uh, uh, five years and has made incredible contributions to their work um, uh, along with Shamnath. Uh, so Swati, if I may just uh, call you on uh, to address the audience. Thank you for that really kind introduction. And it was heartening to be part of a webinar where legal education was put in focus of increasing diversity and inclusion in legal education, a very thought provoking webinar where we talked about diversity and inclusion, which is at the core of IDIA and uh, Shamna Sir's work. So IDIA was started in 2010 by Shamnath sir, when he was teaching in NUJS, and he saw that most of the students in his class were from a very particular background and were not representative of the larger community. And so he started the IDIA movement then, which started with just going 
to a small school in Pelling. Just a few people, volunteers went to a small school in Pelling and talked to students there about law and legal education. And from there, it's now an India-wide movement in more than 20 states now. Uh, so uh, what we do is first we create awareness about law and legal education because there are a lot of negative perceptions about lawyers and there is very less awareness about NLUs and law is not seen as a good option, career option in a lot of places across India. So it's, it's so it should not be something which is city focused. So because so for that reason, we we have uh, reached out to more than thirty eight thousand students across India from all uh, from smaller villages to communities which are not represented, and we have taught talked to them about law and legal education. Next, am I audible? Yes, uh, yes, yes. What we can oh. hear you. Yeah. Okay. So there was a comment that is very okay. Uh, then what we do is we we select students from underrepresented and marginalized communities who, when, who have an aptitude for law and like Shamna sir used like to say fired in their belly to do something and we train them to crack the very competitive law into the examinations along with our partners uh, uh, which are uh, coaching centers across India and we have had more than 450 plus trainees from diverse backgrounds so far and if they crack law school our aim is to not just have law students make law students who go to uh, certain professions only but to make community leaders it's because the idea behind law is that law is a powerful tool which should not be restricted to a certain uh, section of the society but should be available to everyone and one way of doing it is to make the legal education diverse and inclusive so we have program in which our scholars who are students in various law schools uh, contribute towards the community and towards the society. For example, Yogendra took on sand mafia in his village in Jharkhand. And in spite of various threats that he got and effectively shut them down. Uh, we've also had uh, students play a very important role in our uh, recent work in uh, uh, in, uh, due to the impact of COVID and um, Amphan uh, cyclone, uh, we have actually helped set up a tower in a village uh, in Sundarban through which internet would be made available to more than 3,000 families there. So, and the uh, scholars played a very important role in, in helping us with our work. Our relief work has touched more than 4,000 people now. So uh, the idea is that through increasing diversity and inclusion, we are a making the legal education more enriching for the students who are there. Secondly, we are empowering communities uh, through making law as a tool available to them by creating these community leaders. So this is the focus of making diversity and inclusion a part of legal education and the work that IDIA is doing. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Swati. And uh, as, as Justice Mulida said, such powerful work for uh, al almost a decade uh, and, and more power to all of you. And I do hope um, uh, there are lots of people out there uh, who will support your work and carry forward your work and get involved with uh, the truly incredible work that has been happening. Uh, so more power to all of you at IDIA. Uh, thank thank, you, you, thank so you so much for doing this work. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, now, if I may just ask uh, uh, Rohit, Mam, and Alex, to, uh, who's, who's a, 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 fr a friend of Shamnath's, uh, to just uh, reflect uh, on uh, Shamnath's work and legacy. Um, yeah. uh, Rohit, over to you. Yeah, hi. Uh, first of all, I'm grateful to Live Law for organizing this webinar. And I can't think of a more appropriate person to give this talk than Justice Murli there. Now, on the topic of legal teaching and what the intent of it should be, I'm reminded of an anecdote of a guru giving one rupee each to two of his students, one called Chaitra and one called Maitra. And he set them a task, which was to fill up the ro one room each with the money he gave them. 
Uh, Maitra racked his brains as to what was to be done. And he used a one rupee and filled it with garbage. And filled it to the brim with garbage. Needless to be said, the Guru was appalled when he entered the room. And he saw that not only was there filth, but there was terrible stench. The other student, Chaitra, he pondered over a while as to what is to be done. And he spent that one rupee, he bought a matchbox, an incense stick, and an oil lamp. And so filled the room with not just light, but also beautiful fragrance. The Guru was impressed. Legal education has to be like this. And this is what Shamnath aspired to do, whereby he wanted to fill the minds and futures of his students with light and fragrance. Now about him, Shamnath and I, we've been friends for over 30 years. We were classmates in school. We were classmates in law school. We were roommates in law school. Post-graduation, we were even roommates in Delhi till he went to America and London and did his courses. And he always was an integral part of my family and very much loved by my parents, my wife and my children. And I've had a few trying years over the last four years where I was grappling with cancer. And the whole time, Shamnad stood by me like a rock during that time. Now, a lot of people have talked about Shamnath's achievements and what an incredible contribution he has made to legal education and access to for law for students from socially and economically less privileged background. Now, I'd like to narrate certain funny incidents about Shamnath, which some people don't know. Now, when we were in law school, just like Professor uh, Justice Murlidhar had said, we had uh, various interesting professors as well. One was Professor Padmanabha Pillai, who was a professor in corporate law and, and is a fantastic professor. Now, Professor Pillai was extremely fond of me because for some reason he thought that I uh, like literature and arts a lot, and I did. So, and in so far as Shamnath is concerned, there's another reason. So one day, Professor Pillay was standing by a newspaper stand near our, in a, near our classroom. And he was going through it. So Shamnath, as you know, his full name is Shamnath Muhammad Bashir. At that time, there was a, a newspaper clipping of a famous Malayalam uh, literature called Vaikam Muhammad Bashir or Pastavi. And there was a, a, a photo of his with a eulogy, I mean, it's a anniversary thing. So Shamna started sniffling over there. So Professor Pillay asked him, Shamna, what happened? So Shamna said, Sir, why can Muhammad Bashir, my grandfather? So Professor Pillay was like, Agas, he said, your grandfather. And thereafter, he fell head over heels in love with Shamna. And uh, every time, so he pick on either Shamna or me during classroom. Now there's another incident where when Shamna uh, was studying in England. And um, uh, when he was studying in England, uh, he there was a certain Muslim group over there, who Pakistani students, who had adopted Shamnad into their fold, thinking he's a Muslim brother. And they used to invite him over whenever they were having iftar parties. And, and uh, this chap would shamelessly go and have all the biryani and kebabs that they were offering over there. So one day, the, the dean uh, of the university uh, organized some function, the dinner for all the students. And that was the time when their uh, rosa was going on, the fast was going on. So Shamnath was sitting over there and happily having whiskey and wine. And suddenly the Muslim students came there and saw this. They saw this chap having wine and whiskey at the time when he's supposed to have absence. And that would pay to his uh, further invitations for biryani uh, from them. And now there's, a, there's, a, there's an interesting story as to how Shamnath ended up becoming a lawyer and an IP lawyer. So when I was staying in, in Delhi, I was staying in a place called uh, Bogal, Jangpura area. So Shamnath was staying with me that time. And he had come to Delhi uh, aspiring to become an IAS officer. So he wanted this whole Lalbati Gadi 
uh, and you know the people the power and wealth associated with IAS and uh, he was sitting there in, in the in my room and studying for IAS and I used to go I was working in an office called Parik and Company. P.H. Parik was an advocate and recorder just like uh, Justice Murlida used to be an advocate and recorder earlier so he knows who I'm referring to. So uh, I used to go to office and Shamnath would sit over there and uh, study and uh, there was this certain uh, lady who was staying uh, below uh, us uh, the apartment and uh, she told Shamna that you know you, sh you should maybe consider a career in law I mean uh, since you're so good in IP law and all that he said no no I don't want to do that I want to become an IAS officer but there was a problem of money how does he how do we we had limited resources we all came from middle class uh, backgrounds so at that time we found out that I think uh, Hamdard University or I think Hamdard University, they were offering a scholarship for uh, st students who were aspiring for IAS, uh, Muslim students aspiring for IAS. Now, Shamnath wanted to go and uh, write that scholarship examination. And this lady was staying below us. She had a, a motorbike, a scooter, which she used to borrow. And none of us had mobile phones in those days. In those, so I had gone to office. Shamnath uh, tries to go for the uh, entrance examination, the scholarship examination, he finds that the door is locked from outside. This lady has locked the door from outside. And we had this iron door, you know, not the wooden doors you could break open. And he was banging away and there's no, there's no phone. He had no phone and I had no phone either for him to call me and tell me to come and rescue him. So he kept banging away. And uh, after an hour or so, I think the next door neighbor used to be Mr. Praveen Anand's um, stenographer. So they came and opened the door. They broke open the lock and they opened the door. And Shamnath rushed down uh, to get that uh, kinetic Honda. Uh, this lady was smarter than all of us. She had deflated the tires of this kinetic Honda as well. So there was no way for this chap to go for the exam. And so he was so frustrated. So when I came back, he was he didn't know whether to cry or to get angry. So I asked him what happened. And he told me this is what happened. And then uh, he ended up going for somebody, one of our seniors called Prothima Pandey, advised him to go for an interview with Praveen Anand. And he went and saw Praveen Anand. And justifiably, Praveen Anand was impressed. And Shamna joined him and uh, started his career as an uh, IP lawyer. And uh, like I told you, Shamna is always, every time, even when he went abroad, uh, even when he was working in Gurgaon for a while, when he used to come back to India, he used to always come and stay in my house. And I used to keep telling him, why aren't you getting married? And he would never get married. He said, then I used to tell him, listen, if you don't get married now, what will happen to you when you grow older? And he used to tell me, like, your house is always there. I can come and stay in your house. So I told him once, you know, you're the Joey to my Chandler. I mean, I don't know if you, there's a serial called Friends used to be there. So Joey was this uh, unmarried chap who was always be with Chandler. So I used to tell him, you're the Joey to my Chandler. Now about Shamnath, he, I compare him to Achilles from the Greek stories. Shamnath lived a short and glorious life and about whom stories will be told long after he passed on. Odysseus had described Achilles saying, there is not a man in the world more blessed than you. There never has been and never will be. Shamnath's Achilles heel was his unexplainable failing health. He fought on despite it, but ultimately he succumbed as everyone has to. He will be remembered and not forgotten. Death is not the end of life. It is the end of the body. He is continuing in his journey in the stars and heavens. And finally, he's been reunited with his mother uh, who he had lost when we were in school. That was, an, that was a pain which he was never able to come to terms with. So I hope that he's finally re reunited with her and, and having a good time over there. Thank you once again for this organizing this. I won't talk more. There's lots to talk about. Him. And um, I have lost my best friend, best and my oldest friend. And uh, the legal community and the students have lost um, a great, great, great patron and great help. And I hope that uh, his memory is retained and the good work that IDI and others do. And like Justice Murlida said, there has been many more people, many more organizations and many more initiatives like this to keep this memory alive and to keep this going forward. Thank you very much. Um,
thank you, Rohit, for those beautiful words. And I'm sure uh, Shabnan's legacy will uh, only grow and uh, live on more powerfully. So thank you for those words. Uh, and thank you to Live Law for uh, instituting this uh, lecture and, and finding such a relevant way uh, to carry forward his legacy. Uh, so Justice Murlidhar, uh, Swati and Rohit, uh, thank you for uh, joining uh, the lecture today and for, um, for all your powerful words and the powerful work. Um, and also to Live Law once again for putting all of this together and bringing everyone together on this occasion. Um, uh, so thank you. And I hope all of you had uh, a thoroughly uh, intellectually exciting time and, uh, and what a beautiful start to instituting uh, Professor Shamnath Bashir's legacy. Thank you, everyone.